Hello, everyone, and welcome to a very special episode of Cabinet of Curiosities on our own devices. I'm Jean Messier. I'm here with Nick Reeder at the 17-wing aircraft restoration hangar looking at a Link Trainer. This is the world's first mass-produced aircraft simulator, and it was vital to aircraft aircrew training during the Second World War, as well as for a couple of years before and a couple of years afterwards. This is the pioneer of them all. Now, before we get started and look at the fascinating mechanics behind this device, Nick, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and your connection to the Link? What are you doing with this particular one? Absolutely. My name is Nick Reeder. Uh, I'm a professional pilot uh, and volunteer here at 17 Wing. I've owned uh, this Link Trainer and three others like it for the last uh, five years and uh, really got involved with uh, uh, the Link Trainer and interested in it when I saw my first one when I was in an Air Cadets back in the early 90s in Australia. And I've always wanted to own one. An opportunity came up a number of years ago and uh, they jumped on it. So you know, where did you acquire most of these? Uh, three of the four actually came from a single collector here in Winnipeg. And after the fact, um, I'd had it for about a year and got contacted by another fellow who was an acquaintance of the first fellow who had one to sell. So picked it up as well. So they all came actually originally from the same collection at huh. one point. About 30 years ago, one was split off. Now they're all back together again. Nice. A family reunion. <laughs> so and. These are fairly common to find. They made thousands upon thousands of these between 1929, approximately, to the early 50s. So the Link Trainer was the brainchild of one Edwin Link, who invented it in the late 1920s because he had actually tried to get his pilot's license. His first flight, interestingly enough, was with Sidney Chaplin, the brother of Charlie Chaplin, and he found the entire process of getting his license to be less than satisfactory. He found that the instructors didn't actually give him a lot of sick time and it took forever. So he wanted to invent something that would allow pilots to practice, especially instrument flight, on the ground before they ever hopped into an aircraft and it would expedite the process. Now, Link's father owned a, an organ and player piano factory. And this is very evident in the design of this because if you actually look inside it, and we'll look at some of the mechanics of how the Link works, it's all based on air pressure and bellows and vacuum and all the different components that you would find in an organ or a player piano. So without further ado, let's go and have a little bit of a closer look at how this thing actually works. So here we have the Link Trainer in its complete form, and you might notice that it looks quite like a toy. Indeed, that was its very first application. At first, the Link Company had a lot of trouble selling these as legitimate trainers, and so they ended up selling their first models to amusement park, and they were used to give the public a bit of an idea of what it was like to fly an aircraft. It wasn't until 1934 that first the Navy and then the Army Air Corps finally expressed interest in buying these as pilot trainers. And this was in the wake of the U.S. airmail crisis. At first, the U.S. government had given the airmail contract to private companies, but they ended up gouging the government, so the government took the contract back and gave it to the Army Air Corps. Unfortunately, the Army Air Corps had such little experience with instrument flying that a lot of the early airmail pilots died while flying at night or in adverse weather conditions. And so this finally gave the Link Company an in to sell instrument trainers. And Edwin Link sealed the deal by actually making a daring landing in horrible weather at LaGuardia Airport. And this finally convinced the Army Air Corps to purchase a few of these trainers. And they would purchase thousands of these in the coming years, and they would be vital during the Second World War. Indeed, when the war started, 35 countries were actually using the Link, including, and this is one of the first foreign sales, Japan. So there's three basic components. You have the main aircraft cabin, it has a hood that uh, hinges over top of it so that you can't see the world around you. You're only flying on instruments. In the earlier versions, there were actually movable uh, control surfaces on the stabilizers, but uh, later those were eliminated, and later they eliminated, in certain cases, all the surfaces uh, entirely just for wartime expediency. You have the octagon down here. So this consists of a bunch of bellows that would make the aircraft roll, pitch, and yaw. So you'd have bellows on either side to make it roll, bellows in the front and the back to make it pitch, and then you had an air motor that was powered by bellows in the center that would make the whole thing spin 360 degrees. And then down here in the base is a turbine that would produce vacuum. This was run not on positive air pressure, but rather on vacuum pressure, which is what Edwin Link was used to using when building and maintaining organs and player pianos. And we'll look a little more at that technology a little bit later. 
So here I am in the cockpit of the Link, and I have all the controls and instruments that you would expect from a generic aircraft of that period. I've got a pair of rudder pedals, I've got a control column with a yoke. If I wanted to learn to fly a fighter aircraft, I could actually remove this yoke and put in its place a metal control column. I've also got a throttle, I've got a nice hood to isolate me from the outside world so I can fly on instruments, and I have a full set of instruments. Now, like I said, everything on this aircraft is operated by vacuum, as it would be in a player piano or an organ. So when I'm operating all of these controls, I'm actually operating a set of valves that are letting vacuum in and out of various bellows and other devices within the trainer. So for example, if I move the control column forward or back, I'm letting air in and out of a set of bellows in the front and the back that are going to pitch me up or down. Same thing if I turn to the side and roll, and then if I decide to use my rudder pedals or bank, that's going to activate that pneumatic motor that's going to spin me around through 360 degrees. But that's not all that the aircraft does. If it, that's all it did, then it would just be an amusement fair ride. No, this is meant for learning to fly by instruments, so all of the instruments in here are actually simulated. Now some of them are standard instruments, the gyro compass and the magnetic compass among them are just standard instruments that work as they normally would. Others are operated by a very clever vacuum system. So for example, the altimeter, rate of climb, airspeed, and the tachometer are all operated by a vacuum tank system. So there's a vacuum tank up here in the nose of the aircraft, and every time I operate the controls, I'm letting air in and out of that tank. Now for altitude, for example, air pressure in the atmosphere decreases with altitude. So every time I operate the controls, if I pull up, I'm going to be decreasing the pressure in that tank, and the altimeter is going to be reading directly off of it, an artificially simulated altitude. Same thing with the tachometer. Every time I operate the throttle, I'm going to be adjusting the amount of air going in and out of that tank, and that's going to be read by the tachometer gauge, which is actually just a pressure gauge. It's going to give me my engine speed. Same thing with rate of climb. It's all artificially simulated by air pressure. A couple of the other instruments are slightly modified. For example, the artificial horizon is just a pendulum. Normally this would be linked to a gyroscope, but in this case you just need a pendulum to give you your actual horizon line. And a couple of the others are linked to various gyroscopes. There's also radio instruments. So there's a Lorenz blind landing system simulator that would be operated by the instructor. And those are just artificial signals sent from the instructor's desk to instruments on the panel. And it goes even further than that. Edwin Link actually thought of everything when he invented this thing. If I, my airspeed drops below a certain level, below my stall speed, there's actually a spin trip mechanism in here. It's a little pendulum that swings over and actually causes the aircraft to go into a spin. And it will spin me around until I pull my nose down and increase my airspeed to the point where it will actually deactivate the mechanism and I can actually fly straight and level. There's also a mechanism for generating rough air, and we'll look at this later in a little bit more detail, but it's a little cam-operated mechanism that lets air out at random intervals from all of the controls, from all of the bellows, and it creates violent rough air, it creates turbulence. So really, they had thought of absolutely every little thing that a pilot could encounter during flight so he could adequately train for it. So this would give you a very realistic simulation of what it would actually be to fly on instruments. So realistic, in fact, that there's a story of US Navy pilot who was flying a particularly uh, rough simulation where he got so scared that he attempted to bail out and ended up breaking his ankle on the floor as he fell the three feet outside the simulator. All right, Nick, why don't you tell us what we have here? Okay, so this is the uh, instructor's desk, and this would allow the instructor to be able to sit at this location and using the uh, instrument panel on the desk here. Uh, get an idea of what the student was seeing on his instrument panel, and then also be able to track his progress using the crab here uh, on a map that would be displayed on the desk, showing his progress through the air and as he tracked and uh, did various exercises in uh, navigation. Um, inside the uh, drawer here, we have a uh, simulated radio. It doesn't actually transmit, it simulates radio frequencies and uh, signals heading through the wires to the base of the trainer. And this would allow the instructor to be able to throw in and key different Morse codes that the student would hear on his headphones, uh, and also provide different signals for the landing system that is displayed on the instrument panel to be uh, flown. 
they're saying the different Morse code signals, so those would be simulated by these little cam wheels. So it'd be correct. a different set of signals for each cam wheel that he could plug in there, and there's a nice little mechanism right here. Exactly, and as you can see, like everything else in 1930s technology, yep. vacuum it's all, tubes. It's all tube. Well, yep. transistors hadn't been invented yet, so. That's right, that's right. So as the trainee flew along, the link would actually be connected to the crab, two synchronous motors, and then, yeah, this would just glide along the surface and track his progress. Correct. And then, so this is not a um, wartime accessory right here, correct? No, this is one of the many modifications that would have been done in its uh, post-war career. Uh, and at this point, I believe this was uh, uh, in its time serving with, uh, with Trans-Canada Airlines, what is now Air Canada. Um, so this whole uh, con construction here would not be there. It would have actually just been one big tube coming over with just a simple cable coming down that would plug into the top of the yeah. crab. So what other sorts of things would the instructor be able to control? For example, what are these cranks over here on the end of the desk? Right. These uh, cranks allow the instructor to be able to uh, crank in both wind velocity and direction to allow the student to practice more complex exercises in tracking uh, various navigational aids. Uh, and also, although I don't have one unfortunately to show, uh, the original uh, uh, link trainer would have a fuel gauge in inverted commas, and all it was was a simple wind-up clock mechanism that by winding it up, it would indicate 50 gallons and simply start counting down. And after an hour, the uh, clock function would shut the power off to the link okay. and basically allow the, if this instructor wishes to wish to uh, demonstrate that lesson, cause the student to have to monitor fuel. Though mm -hmm. there was no way to really manage the fuel, it was more simply yet one more thing to have to watch as a student practicing an exercise that I got to keep an eye on the time because I'm running out of gas. Yeah. And so. we'll look at it a little bit later on. On the top of the hood, you also had indicators for your landing gear and other things that you had to take care of, correct? That is correct, yeah. There are three lights that appear on the top of the hood. Uh, P, W, and F is how they're labeled. Propeller, wheels, and flaps. And all they were was just a simple switch in the flight deck. Cockpit, sorry. That the student would switch, that would really just light up the light and tell the instructor that, okay, I'm cognizant of the fact that I'm coming into land, I need my pitch, my propeller pitch in full fine, mm -hmm. I need my wheels down and my flaps down. And that's what those lights would, seem, uh, would indicate. So, uh, yeah, that was a... Uh, they really thought of everything. They thought of everything, that's correct. And to show you just how much they thought of everything, we're going to go inside uh, to the other hangar and we're going to look at some of the individual components and show you some of the really neat engineering behind some of the systems on the link. So here we are back in the shop, uh, looking at some of the smaller components of the Link Trainer, the guts of the system, just to show you some of the interesting engineering that went into these. So this is the heart of the system. This is the vacuum turbine, correct? That is correct, yes. It's a three-quarter horsepower motor driving a four-stage uh, uh, centrifugal compressor. Uh, puts out about, uh, about four to four and three-eighths inches of mercury. The system requires four to run. The extra three-eighths of an inch is basically there to cover any system loss through leaks yeah. and things. Yeah, and so everything on this in this system works by a vacuum. So it works a little bit backwards than you might expect in a system that runs on positive air pressure. So, for example, uh, this is one of the bellows that actually actuates the movement of the simulator itself. So where would this particular bellows have come from? Uh, this is one of the four of them that will sit in the uh, rotating octagon uh, in the between the base and the fuselage of the link. Uh, this particular one is a roll bellow. It uh, uh, differs slightly from the pitch bellows, and there's two of each, in size only, but in function it's identical. Uh, it's... Uh, they are held uh, open by their opposite vacuum. And as one vacuum is increased, it will then uh, cause the bellow to contract on one side and expand on the other, and vice versa. So yeah, there's no springs or anything, it's just that the uh, this fuselage is balanced and then one is pulling and then the other is pulling differentially. Basically, yeah, that's correct. Yeah. And yep. then of course you have the outlet valves right here and mm -hmm. these are made of chamois? Or that's correct. Chamois and, and then it's, yeah, that's yeah. right. And some are uh, rubber back canvas rubber as well material. Canvas, yeah. That's right. That's right. right. So, um, so yeah, so that's for linear motion, but what about rotational motion? What about yaw to actually make the simulator turn around and round? Well, then you go to this 
fantastic contraption. I can't get enough of this. Uh, yeah, this is the yaw motor, and this is operated entirely by vacuum, and it doesn't work the way you think it would. It works, like everything else, on bellows, if you'd like to demonstrate sure. by turning it. So basically the vacuum comes in through these two ports here, one on each side, and again increasing the vacuum on one side and releasing on the other causes the bellows to do their thing and turn one way or the other. Yeah, and it, so by reversing the vacuum you would get it to run one side, one direction, or the other. So it's basically a, it's a pneumatic stepper motor because it allows you to have very precision turning with no backlash or coasting. Correct. You can turn and then be kept in that position. So it's a whole bunch of bellows acting like the pistons in a gasoline engine, pumping back and forth and turning this crankshaft. And I absolutely love this because when you get into the mechanics of the Link train, you really see the influence of Link's uh, experience with organs and player pianos. It's what, uh, and I see this also in, if you look at some of the, uh, the equipment that was designed by the Wright brothers early in their experiments, Everything was made of bicycle spokes and bicycle chains and pulleys and sprockets and everything like that. So when you look at the Wright Flyer and everything that the Wrights did, that's how a bicycle mechanic would build an aircraft. And the Link Trainer is how a organ and player piano uh, producer or repairman would design an aircraft. It's a really, it's a really bizarre way of looking at it, of solving these very elemental problems, but it works. Totally functional. It's yeah. completely functional. It's just, it's such an interesting mindset <laughs> for my money. Exactly. Exactly. I, I, as you say, I can't get enough of how much this, like the intricacy of just designing this, how anyone would have just come up with the what's required there to just to make it do its thing and it's yeah but if that's what you're used to using then it's and that's what you're used to using and that's what you're going to design best absolutely okay. so here's a component we actually haven't spoken of before this is a rough air generator and this is one of the many examples of just the little things that they thought of that you would never think of just thinking what you what would you put in a flight simulator in the early 1930s so uh, just give us an idea of how this actually works. Okay, this is actually mounted in the aft rear lower section of the uh, uh, fuselage. Uh, crank handle on the back here is uh, designed to be accessible by the instructor. And the idea here is that there is a uh, constant velocity motor that drives and just turns this. And as soon as you turn the link on, the motor starts turning. So this is constantly just turning, moving these uh, lobes here, which then, as at the instructor's discretion, he can crank this lever, raising this whole assembly here up in such a way that as the thing turns, should be turning it the right way here, these little tappet valves start to release and they are all hooked up to each of the six uh, directions of turn. So two for pitch, two for roll, and two for yaw. And they release little spurts of vacuum and in doing so create a jolt in the system in that particular axis. So it keeps interrupting the flow of vacuum into those bellows and it creates turbulence. Correct. So, yeah, so the instructor can create rough weather for the uh, for the trainee if he wants to. And if he's really feeling sadistic, he can really <laughs> crank it on and have quite a lot of motion. The thing to remember about the link is it's fairly unstable. Uh, so you're having to correct any little drop, wing drop, nose drop, whatever. The student has to recover from that. Otherwise, it's, you know, this thing is designed to be a little tricky to fly. So it's just testing his motions and his reactions to keep it steady and tracking. Yeah, and especially if later he's going to be flying something like the Harvard. The Harvard is a little bit difficult. That's correct, yeah. Yep. Or any, or any high-performance fighter is going to be a little bit tricky, and this will give you very good simulation of that. Exactly right, yeah. exactly right. And this was the uh, the first piece that I restored, and I'm quite proud of the, <laughs> the way it turned out. It looks beautiful. It's yeah. a beautiful little mechanical piece. I think it's a nice little microcosm of how the whole thing operates. Absolutely. And uh, um, again, just such a simple little design, and yet very important in the overall yeah. scheme of the, of yeah. the training, and the against, lesson. And so. again, something very, this would be just a pipe organ. Yep. In a pipe organ, you would have this very same technology. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. So. Okay. So what's this right here, this little valve assembly? Uh, basically, it's called the climb dive valve. Um, it's, uh, uh, despite the name, it's actually hooked up to the 
indicating system as opposed to the, the pitch system on the aircraft. Yeah, so this wouldn't be controlling actual motion of the aircraft. No. This would be that vacuum tank system. Correct. That where it's taking vacuum in and out of the tank and giving you your either rate of climb or altitude. Yeah. That's correct. Yep. And in a nutshell, we've got one valve for the climb, one valve for descent. Uh, the climb valve, again, because as you go up in altitude, pressure decreases, yeah. so it's actually hooked up to vacuum. And the dive valve is actually through this little filter, is just hooked up to atmosphere. And it's just venting. It's just venting, that's yeah. correct. And these are very fine little uh, devices, got very fine little needle valves inside here. And uh, uh, yeah, it looks nice and shiny. Climb cleaned up pretty well. Uh -huh. Hopefully, I didn't damage it while I was adjusting it because they are very, very finicky, the Ooh. valves inside. So yeah, I'll find out when I turn it on. Yeah. <laughs> so. And then another example of, again, tiny little things that are very important when you're learning to fly, but you know, I wouldn't have thought of putting this in a very early simulator, not especially not in the early 30s. So this is uh, it's a slipstream uh, simulator, correct? Correct, so yeah. So it's basically just a dash pot. So where would that be installed? Uh, one on each uh, control surface, if you will. Uh, one for pitch, one for roll, one for yaw. And the idea behind it was to give the trainee an indication of the slipstream and its force on the moving control surface. If you don't have any feedback, mm -hmm. you can sit there and really whack the controls around. Yeah. This will help dampen that and through a valve on the side, the wasn't so much the instructor could do it, this was yeah. buried deep in the system, but an engineer or the um, mechanic could come in and actually vary the resistance and provide more uh, resistance as required. So if you're at a base where there are flying Harvards and more high-performance yeah. aircraft, you want a bit more resistance yeah. versus at one of the elementary flying schools where they flew Tiger Moths or Cornells yeah. and you have lighter resistance. Yeah, lighter resistance, yeah. So, interestingly yeah. enough, 1930s vintage automobile component there. Anyone okay. who's restored any hot rods and things, these apparently are used in this, the suspension system of those. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, that yeah. makes a lot of sense. And it's again, it's something that we think is very, very modern, which is haptics in flight simulators. Yeah. But no, right from the very <laughs> beginning, you yeah. had that sort of force feedback system. So again, very much ahead of its time. Absolutely. And this is one of my favorites, just because, again, it's one of those tiny things you would never think of. Uh, so this is a vibrator for the instruments, because... Instruments in a regular aircraft are subject to vibration, and so that vibration is constantly stopping them from hanging up and from getting mm -hmm. stuck. But if you don't have that, the link is sitting on the ground, there's no engine in it, there's no vibration, those instruments get stuck all the time. So you have to put this little vibrator behind them. And actually, that was something that uh, a lot of Air Forces learned when they switched over to jets. All their instruments started freezing up. <laughs> Airlines as well, like the de Havilland Comet, they finally had to put little vibrators behind the instrument panels because they Engines ran so smoothly, jets didn't put out as much vibration as piston engines or uh, or even turboprops. So yeah, they had to have a little vibrator to simulate that to get their instruments to actually work. Just something they didn't think of when they all had piston engines. And finally, after all of those vacuum or mechanically operated systems, we finally come to the few electrically actuated components of the link. So what do we have here? Uh, three, major, three components here. Telegon oscillator, which sits in the base of the uh, the unit um, and is responsible for the replication of those three instruments that sit on the instructor's desk, being the altimeter, the airspeed indicator, and the vertical speed indicator. Uh -huh. This will provide the power to uh, turn those Telecron uh, motors that basically will uh, cause instantaneous indication on both the instructor's desk and the, the instruments and the instrument panel for the student. Yeah, so those instruments would be connected to transmitters like this one? That is correct, yes. And then that would transmit the signal to both the instructor's instrument panel and the student's instrument panel, giving them the same indication. So what this is, how this works, mm -hmm. this is a 700 hertz power supply that supplies electricity to what are basically synchronous motors. There are alternating current motors, AC motors, when you turn the rotor on one of them, it's going to cause a phase imbalance. And to correct that imbalance, all of the other rotors on all the other motors connected to the circuit are going to turn to the same position and cancel that out. So basically you have one transmitter, you can turn it, all the others are going to turn by the same amount. And so you can transmit the same signals to two sets or more of instruments, including the crap. So this is what would actually skim over the surface of the map on the instructor's desk, correct? That's correct, yes. Yeah. So you can see on this one here, it's, uh, uh, there, again, there are multiple designs of these. They all different plugs, different over the years, all modified. This one, I believe, is relatively original. Simple on-off switch on the top. Um, on the bottom here, you can see we have the uh, yeah. the main motor in there. Yeah. Um, 
which will then turns the the gears in the middle here and causes the, these two drive wheels, which turn at a constant speed, yep. and they actually have gearing in them that you can change the actual speed from, I think it's 0.8 inch okay. per minute to, I think, 3.2 inches per minute as it tracks. So this would be like for different aircraft? Uh, I assume different, so, or different, different... speed of aircraft, yeah. Uh, but also actually for different um, uh, exercises being... And, and I'm guessing different scales of maps. Exactly as well. for different scales. So if you're doing yeah. a, a, practicing a, an instrument landing, you yeah. want something with a bit more, I guess, fidelity. So maybe they go with the, the well, it's a larger map, so you probably need the faster speed in order to cover it a bit more yeah. quickly than you would if you had a much larger scale map mm -hmm. that had, you know, you'd use the 0.8 inch yeah. per per minute. And I think is another example of like the limitations of the verisimilitude is that since these are constant speed motors, your throttle input probably wouldn't do anything. No, that's correct. Yeah. It's so, purely moving the gears here to yeah. like a shifting on your car. You've got the, 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 the uh, high speed, mm -hmm. low speed, basically. Yeah. So just like with your fuel consumption, your throttle position wouldn't really control anything. Same thing here, your throttle position really wouldn't control how fast you track across the map. So no. there were limitations. They did think of a lot of things. They didn't think of absolutely everything. No, that's right. And of course, right here you have, this is the inking wheel. Correct. And there would actually be a little arm coming off the back here with a, a felt. Okay. Uh, a, 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 it would be an ink-soaked ink felt applicator, except, yeah. essentially. In, so like a marker, basically. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's and, I'm, um, and then, of course, a couple of lights here that would then, in mm -hmm. lower light in situations, I guess the instructor could then see mm -hmm. a little bit more of what's going on underneath. And then one other thing I just wanted to point out, uh, and we'll get a shot here of the data plate on this. Uh, of course, link trainers were used extensively in Canada for the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan, but actually a lot of them were manufactured in Canada. So we have the link manufacturing company in Gananoque. And the story that I heard is that the links actually had a summer house nearby, which is why they actually built the factory there. That's correct. That's yeah. correct. And the other the American factory was, I think, in Binghamton, New York. Which yeah, which is where, he, where the link factory first originally also had a flying school in the basement there. Correct. That's yeah, right. That's, that's right. That's why we got started out. So, yeah, so like I said, very few electronic components on this entire system is almost entirely mechanical. It's just an ingenious system, and it just shows you, even with very primitive technology, what you can accomplish. And there's a quote, I'll put it up on the screen, from an air marshal, I believe, where he said that the Luftwaffe met its Waterloo, you know, in a link trainer, because so many uh, air crew were trained on, on them and learned their instrument flying and learned to be effective pilots. So it really was one of those like unsung, war-winning weapons of the Second World War. Anyway, I've thoroughly enjoyed looking at all these guts and all of the work that you've done on it. Thank you so much for showing me your collection and showing me all of these components and everything like that. My pleasure. Um, this is Nick Reeder. I'm Gilles Messier. I'll see you next time on another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities on our own devices, where we'll look at more fascinating artifacts like this one, hopefully at other museums, stuff that's just as detailed. Until then, have a great day.